A little over a week ago, the actress Melissa Joan Hart made a comment to a reporter about how there couldn't be a reboot of her 1990s sitcom Sabrina the Teenage Witch, saying that, I just don't think that it would be as great as the original. I don't think there's any way. People are nostalgic for what they had. Trying to recreate that can be really difficult. She also added, Everyone's talking about her and Harvey having a baby, and that baby finds out she's got powers or something? Hmm. Uh, setting aside who everyone is, this was quite interesting to me. I was curious about her claim that no reboot of Sabrina the Teenage Witch could ever be as great as the original. Was the original Sabrina the Teenage Witch really that good? I mean, I have vague memories of watching it, but I also remember that show getting really, really weird by the end of its run, eventually collapsing in on itself in a heap of nonsense that, well, we'll get to that, but the question of the day is this. Is the original Sabrina the Teenage Witch something that is so unique and good that it can never be rebooted? Or is it something that could, or indeed should, be remade? To this end, I binge-watched all 163 episodes of the series, plus all three made-for-TV films, and it was an experience. <sighs> and I have notes. So let's get straight to it and start with this. 1. Origins I'm not going to spend too much time with this, but I do think it's worth acknowledging that the sitcom Sabrina the Teenage Witch was actually based on a comic book, which had previously been adapted as an animated series. The character was more or less a one-sentence joke that kind of got out of hand. It's uh, just like the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles or Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Sabrina the Teenage Witch was just a funny name. Uh, just imagine one of those green wart-covered witches, but like a teenager? Ugh, isn't that silly? And I love the fact that it succeeded. I love the fact that apparently Sabrina's creators had no idea it would connect so strongly with audiences and basically wrote it as a one-off gag. It's just great. Now, by the time Melissa Joan Hart's take on Sabrina began, the idea of a teenager with magical powers was no longer quite as fresh and novel as it had once been. This was, of course, a post-teen witch world. And there had now been multiple examples of shows in which a person with supernatural powers tries to navigate normal life. From Bewitched and I Dream of Genie, which started airing a few years after Sabrina was created, to the sitcom Out of This World, which featured the teenage daughter of an alien, and which I mentioned only to say that Burt Reynolds played the alien for some reason? His name was Troy, he appeared via a glowing cube made of crystals, the magical alien powers were called Gleeping. Uh, it's not a good show, don't look it up, but I just wanted to use it as an example of how the conceit of Sabrina the Teenage Witch was no longer quite as novel as it had originally been. I also wanted to say Gleeping. Gleeping. Still, the concept of a teenage witch is a good premise. It's a strong premise. And in 1996, it was adapted for a made-for-TV movie. Uh, two things are interesting about this film. First, Ryan Reynolds is in it. And secondly, this film represents pretty much the most straightforward adaptation of the concept of a teenage witch. Things on the TV show will get weird, very weird, but this movie presents us with the most neutral version of this premise, and it is really well done. If the franchise had gone no further, I could see this film being a staple of 90s nostalgia on its own because it does a fairly strong job of telling the story of this character. But of course, the franchise didn't end there. It went on and on. And so, after the made-for-TV movie was apparently successful, a television series began production. And, with the preliminaries out of the way, let's get to what we all came here for. 2. The TV Show Begins now, full disclosure, I expected to look back on Sabrina the Teenage Witch with disdain. Uh, maybe it might be enjoyable to poke fun at it, uh, maybe be a little snarky, but no, it turns out that it is really, really good. 
And there were actually a couple of reasons for that. First of all, the core conceit of a teenage girl having magical powers is a strong one. There's a reason people keep making it the centerpiece of their media franchises. It works both as wish fulfillment for teenage audience members and as an interesting way of approaching traditional teenage storylines in a narratively fresh way. Uh, sure, every sitcom with a teenager since the beginning of television has told a story about a teenager getting their first kiss, but how many of them use that premise to have the teenager cross a rickety rope bridge over a river of fire and lava? Almost none! In many ways, this reminds me of Star Trek, taking universal, relevant stories and using elements of sci-fi and fantasy to make them a bit more exciting. And yes, I said sci-fi, we'll come to that. The point I'm trying to make is that Sabrina the Teenage Witch had an advantage over every other teenage sitcom. It was more visually interesting, the stories were more exciting, and it was just funnier. And how could it not be funnier? Because while other shows were stuck writing jokes to put in the mouths of obnoxious brothers or condescending parents, here we got Sabrina's wisecracking cat and her two cool ants. And even without that element, the writing of this show was just stronger than I had expected it to be. A uh, fun fact, Frank Conniff from Mystery Science Theater 3000 and later the head writer of Invader Zim was actually the show's executive story editor and wrote 13 episodes. And the show's creator wrote for the cult comedy classics It's Gary Shandling's Show, Space Ghost Coast to Coast, and actually wrote the season 2 episode of The Simpsons where Homer eats poison blowfish. And just by me saying that, I'm willing to bet that there are a couple of you who are thinking... Do I need to give Sabrina the Teenage Witch a shot? Because these are the credits of people who were entrenched in the too-cool-for-school comedy nerd scene of 90s television. Maybe not the names you might expect to be associated with a show called Sabrina the Teenage Witch. And while it can be hard in a video like this to illustrate strong writing, I'd like to point out one of the most interesting elements of this show. So in the original Sabrina comics, the original Sabrina animated show, and the original Sabrina movie, the concept of what a witch was wasn't really developed beyond using some traditional witch-related iconography. Uh, some pointy hats, a spell book, a crystal ball, the old cliches. This show, however, had a much looser and more irreverent take on that whole witch thing. Uh, sure, you've got the spell book and an odd cauldron or two, but you also have the witches vacationing on Mars, holograms, time travel, virtual reality, a killer doll, a chicken news anchor, an alien abduction, and yeah, I think it's fair to say that they've moved beyond the traditional iconography of witches. Here, the magical world exists in the quote, other realm, which is just such a delightfully simple name for such a place. Oh, where are witches from? They're not from this realm, they're from the other realm. As much as the original concept of Sabrina was based on the humorous contrast of witch iconography with a modern teenager, you don't really get a ton of that here, and I think that's a big part of why the show succeeds. The way that the show builds out its magical world is just so creative and random, I love it. Another reason for the show's success comes from the way in which all of the characters in Sabrina's home life are given an enormous amount of specificity and detail. Uh, Sabrina's aunts, which had previously been rather bland characters, were now portrayed as the serious Zelda and the fun, wisecracking Hilda. But these characters had dimension. Zelda loved science, but she wasn't a simple nerd. She also had romantic relationships and had fun. And while Hilda was less responsible, she wasn't a doofus. She played classical violin and could prove to be a reliable and strict guardian when needed. The ants weren't just cartoonish children's TV versions of adults. They were as well-defined, or actually more well-defined, than the teenage characters were. And then there's the talking cat. And it would have been so easy to just write in a talking cat, give him a few wisecracks, and let that be enough. But instead, the writers decided that the character of Salem Saberhagen the cat was actually a megalomaniacal dictator who tried to conquer the world 
failed and was sentenced to live as a cat as punishment. And take a step back now. What is that? Who came up with that? It's so bonkers. It has nothing to do with witchcraft or the premise of the show or teenage life. But okay. And just to be clear here, pretty much none of this character detail from Hilda, from Zelda, and certainly not from Salem was present in previous incarnations of the franchise. This was all created by the people working for this show, the ones who had worked on stuff like MST3K and The Simpsons. In addition to all of this, Sabrina the Teenage Witch was just a cool show. It had a ton of cameos from Britney Spears, Avril Lavigne, Usher, Coolio, Cisco, both NSYNC and the Backstreet Boys. It also featured a ton of cameos that were primarily for grown-ups, like Dick Van Dyke, Barbara Eden, Raquel Welsh, Shirley Jones, Davy Jones, Chris Elliott, Dom DeLuise, Dick Clark, Frankie Avalon, Steve Allen, Buddy Hackett, and the cast of Laugh In. <sighs> I just need to make it clear here that this is not what you would expect from this type of show. The similar sitcom Teen Angel, which was a contemporary of Sabrina, certainly didn't pull this kind of celebrity weight. Although, and I really feel like I shouldn't say this, uh, the 1997 sitcom Teen Angel, which I know isn't what we're here to talk about and we're not going to, but it was actually created by Al Jean and Matt Reese, two very prolific early Simpsons writers and features Ron Glass as God's cousin Rod, and also one episode was written by Larry Wilmore? I know this isn't what we're here to talk about, but in case you were wondering what I was going to be doing after I hit publish on this video, it's watching every episode of Teen Angel, but <clears throat> we're not here to talk about that, so quit distracting me. Okay, back on track. We've established that the premise of Sabrina was strong, that the writing was strong, and that there was a definite cool factor to the show. I say all of this to lay a foundation for what I have to say next, which is that, well, as good as Sabrina the Teenage Witch could be, it was also a show that was deeply, fundamentally flawed. 3. The Problem with Sabrina a little while ago, I discussed how well-defined the characters of Hilda, Zelda, and Salem were. It might have escaped your attention that I didn't mention the characters of Sabrina's friends, her boyfriend, or any of the characters at school, or, come to think of it, the character of Sabrina herself. And let's start there. Sabrina is a cipher. She is bland and ill-defined, and to a certain extent, I think this is intentional. Sabrina is generic, but she's generic on purpose. Her objective in this series is not to be an interesting character. She's meant to be someone who anyone in the audience can imagine themselves as. Sabrina makes the choices that you probably would in any given situation. She cares about the kind of things that the average teenager might. She is you, and you are her. We are all Sabrina. This is a part of the show's wish-fulfillment fantasy. If Sabrina were too distinct, she might be harder for the folks at home to see themselves in. And so, in any given story, Sabrina is exactly as smart as she needs to be, exactly as responsible as she needs to be, and exactly as competent at magic as she needs to be. Uh, maybe in this episode, she's nerdy and wants to join the science club but also maybe in the next episode she's not that bright and has trouble grasping basic scientific concepts on a test. Uh, she's uncool and dorky, but she's also stylish with perfect hair and makeup. Most of the other characters are similarly thinly written. Uh, Sabrina's boyfriend Harvey is a dim-witted jock who's nice and, well, nice, I guess? And Sabrina's best friend Jennifer is so bland that she gets swapped for a new best friend Valerie between seasons one and two, and Valerie herself gets written off between seasons without any goodbye either. The show's principal is a generic sitcom principal, her teachers are stock sitcom teachers, and mean cheerleader Libby is, well, okay, Libby is pretty great. As originally written, this is your typical popular cheerleader character, but it seems as though the writers really had a lot of fun writing for her and came up with some pretty fun scenarios to place her in. Uh, there's actually a brilliant season one episode where Sabrina turns Libby into a nerd, thinking that Libby can hopefully learn some empathy through her experiences. 
Unfortunately, Sabrina finds out that Libby is popular not because she's a cheerleader, but because she's able to convince other people to become her followers, and so soon, Libby and her new gang of nerds begin ruling the school with the same iron fist that Libby used to wield with her cheerleader friends. It is a really fun plot, and I hate to say it, but the actress who plays Libby, Jenna Lee Green, is so much better at comedy than Melissa Joan Hart is, she steals pretty much every scene they share. But in the end, even Libby turns out to be kind of boring, and the reason for that is simple. No matter how interesting these characters could be, they were always going to be hamstrung by the fact that they could never ever know that Sabrina was a witch, and so they were always doomed to be oblivious to the episode's main plot. Just by definition, they had to remain inconsequential to the story's central conflict and irrelevant to its resolution, and with that narrative rule, there really isn't a way for them to ever be interesting. You can actually feel the show's writers trying to figure a way out of this. In multiple episodes, the mortal characters get incorporated into the magical plots only to have their memories of the events erased. It actually becomes a bit of a running joke. The show desperately wants to use these characters, but it can't do so in any meaningful or lasting way. Uh, one thing I'll note here is that in many post-Sabrina sitcoms about a teenager with powers, the writers seem to have realized that this might be a problem and have made sure to include at least one friend character who is clued in on the main character's secret. You see this in Every Which Way, The Wizards of Waverly Place, and The Thundermans. Even Hannah Montana had a best friend who knew that she was Hannah Montana. There is a reason for this, and you can see what happens if you don't in this show. After season one, it appeared that the show's writers tried to correct this problem by introducing various other characters who could know about Sabrina's powers. First, you had the Quizmaster, a witch whose job it was to train Sabrina so that she could receive her witch's license. Then you had Dreema, a young witch who Sabrina was responsible for training. There was Dashiell, a witch boy who Sabrina became romantically involved with, and eventually you got Brad the Witch Hunter who... I think was supposed to be a more serious threat for Sabrina? But really, none of them worked all that well, and none of them lasted. Uh, during this time, the writers also tried to create some ongoing storylines to add interest. Notably, these tended to be based in the magic world, and not in the world of teenage troubles. As mentioned, you had Sabrina's quest to earn her witch's license. And then you had Sabrina going on a season-long quest to learn her family's secret via a series of images that spelled out a phrase. I mentioned Dreema, I mentioned the Witch Hunter, but these all ended up being pretty boring, and I think the reason why none of them worked particularly well was because they strayed away from that original premise. You remember the one that was so strong, the concept of a typical teenage girl facing her typical teenage troubles with novel magical approaches? But time and again, especially starting in seasons 3 and 4, it started to feel like the writers were growing almost resentful of the fact that they had to include this high school element in their show. More time was spent on Hilda and Zelda's love life. They gave Sabrina a job working at a coffee shop. Libby was written off. Sabrina's best friend was written off. Hilda and Zelda bought a magic clock shop that... I mean... I don't even know what amazing storytelling possibilities the writers thought they would wring out of that premise. It was clear that this show was running out of steam, because as interesting and clever as the original premise was, it was always doomed to be limited. The concept of a teenage sitcom is always going to be finite, because after four seasons, the characters done with their high school experience, what can you do then? Well, like so many other successful teenage sitcoms before it, Sabrina sent its protagonist to college. And oof, what a rough transition that was. For the college years. I put it to you that if Sabrina the Teenage Witch had ended after only three seasons, it would be considered to this day an all-time classic of the genre. 
I further contend that if Sabrina the Teenage Witch had been cancelled after four seasons, it would still be considered a mostly good show that was fondly remembered. But like so many TV shows before and since, this one would not end, because even though the show was literally called Sabrina the Teenage Witch, we were now moving on to Grown Up Sabrina. Starting in Season 5, Sabrina moved out of her home, leaving behind Aunts Hilda and Zelda, and gaining a whole new ensemble of wacky sitcom characters to be around. You've got three roommates, self-centered Morgan, grungy activist Roxy, and alien-obsessed weirdo Miles. And there's Josh, the dreamy manager of a coffee shop that Sabrina works at. And do you remember how we just did a whole thing about how, given the premise of this show, it was impossible to incorporate the mortal characters and the witch storylines in anything approaching a satisfying manner? Yeah, that hasn't changed. And the series has now saddled itself with four characters that it cannot do very much with, and sidelined the magical ant characters that it could. And this is the part of the video where I have to maybe do some speculation about why these changes occurred, and what role Melissa Joan Hart might have had in orchestrating them. You see, Melissa Joan Hart was 20 years old when the first season of Sabrina the Teenage Witch was being produced. She actually had to drop out of college to take the role because her mother and her mother's production company purchased the rights to the character of Sabrina. I do not know how happy the 20-something-year-old actress was as the star of a kiddie TV show about a talking cat. I do know that during this time, she was reportedly experimenting with drugs and alcohol and gave an infamously disastrous interview to Maxim Magazine after parting too hard at the Playboy Mansion the night before and finding herself hung over during her nude photo shoot for them. And... Look, I'm not judging her for any of that, not at all, but I do want to entertain the idea that perhaps Melissa Joan Hart was interested in shifting the show's focus and tone to one that was more in line with what she as a woman in her mid-twenties was going through, and that maybe telling stories about a teenage girl getting her first car, but oh no, the car has a personality and is voiced by Buddy Hackett, maybe that wasn't all that interesting to her. Consider the following. The year was 2000. Friends was one of the most popular TV shows in the world, and Sabrina the Teenage Witch was switching networks from the Disney-owned channel ABC to the cool, hip WB, which was home to shows like Dawson's Creek, Felicity, and Charmed. Was Melissa Joan Hart maybe a little embarrassed to be the star of a brightly colored children's show? I don't know, but... As Sabrina went to college, the show attempted to take a more mature tone, and it didn't work. If the best episodes of the first few seasons were the ones that focused on Sabrina's high school troubles, it's telling that here the show is almost completely disinterested in Sabrina as a student attending college. Instead, most of her troubles come from her love life, from Sabrina's friends, from various magical shenanigans, and from Sabrina's attempts at becoming a reporter. If the core conceit of the series worked because it featured relatable, universal teenage problems filled through a magical lens, what do we have now? Why would the series throw away such a strong storytelling engine in favor of such sloppiness? And sloppiness is perhaps the best word to describe this new Sabrina the Teenage Witch. Gone is nearly all narrative elegance, as the writers toss the concept of a magic clock shop in the trash and have Aunt Hilda randomly purchase the coffee shop that Sabrina works at, while at the same time Aunt Zelda randomly gets a job as a teacher at Sabrina's school, and also George Went is on the series now as a gruff newspaper editor that Sabrina works for because, you know, what the show really needed was one more mortal character. I get the feeling that the series wanted to be an ensemble, that it wanted to have a Friends-style hangout vibe with romantic entanglements, love triangles, and job-based subplots, but that it never really understood how to do that, because it, just look at the Season 5 title sequence. It's not an ensemble. It's Sabrina, 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 Sabrina all the time. Maybe this was because either Melissa Joan Hart or some other creative force 
just behind the scenes refused to let anyone else share the spotlight, or maybe it was because, as I mentioned before, the very premise of the show, with Sabrina's magic powers being a secret, made making the series into an ensemble a complete impossibility. As an aside, I do have to remark on one genius thing that the show did do during this era. It let Sabrina's longtime boyfriend Harvey learn her secret, and I cannot tell you how fresh this felt. In a season that was such a long slog, every scene where Harvey helped Sabrina with her magic troubles was just glorious. And also, by the end of the era, Harvey and Salem the Cat end up developing a pretty fun dynamic as Salem's mischievous nature and Harvey's dopey persona make for a really fun pairing. And yeah, maybe the show could have worked in this iteration if it had focused more on college-related plots, if it had pared down the expanded ensemble of useless characters, if it had given Harvey more to do, but it didn't. And as the series entered its seventh and final season, things somehow got even worse as the show's creative forces doubled down on pretty much every bad decision they had ever made. Five. The end. The final season of this show completely fascinates me. They've written off both aunts entirely, meaning that Sabrina and the talking cat are the only main characters from the show's early days. They've also taken out most of the characters that they had introduced in season 5, including Sabrina's longtime love interest Josh and Nerdy Miles. Instead, we're introduced yet again to a brand new ensemble of lovable characters. These ones work at Scorch Magazine, where Sabrina is now employed as a reporter. You've got Cole, Annie, James, Leonard, and honest to God, do any of you even remember these characters? I doubt it. And why would you? The show doesn't even seem particularly interested in them. The premise of the series is no longer a typical teen with magical powers navigates her relatable high school experiences, but is now a woman in her 20s gets a job as a reporter, and also she has some friends who she lives in a mansion with, and also she has a cat that talks, and also she has magical powers, and also her high school boyfriend is sometimes there too? It is just so so sloppy. And now I'd like to return to that quote that we began with from Melissa Joan Hart, where she argues that so many people would just love to see a series about Sabrina the Teenage Witch, only now she's in her 40s and also she's a mom. I just really don't think that she understands what made this show work in the first place and why it was such a huge initial success and also why it flamed out so spectacularly in its final years. Because Sabrina the Teenage Witch was never really about the character of Sabrina, who was never written with any depth or nuance. No, it was about the show's audience imagining themselves in her shoes, going on her adventures, facing the relatable challenges of midterms, dating, chores, family events, babysitting, slumber parties, field trips, driving, first jobs, first loves, first kisses, and seeing those familiar storylines placed in new novel contexts. What this show never really understood was that fans of Sabrina the Teenage Witch were not here for Sabrina. They were here for the teenage witch part. Well, at least that's what I think. I'm really curious if you think that I'm wrong about all this. Uh, were you a big fan of the Scorch Magazine era of the show? Uh, did you love the magical clock shop? Were you hoping that Josh would win Sabrina's heart? Or do you mostly remember the show from those early years, having blocked out what came after? Let me know before, and if you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing and maybe check out some of the other videos that I made. I really appreciate you watching, and I hope you all have a great day. Bye!